Good afternoon, I think it is at this point. It's certainly been an interesting and stimulating morning, and I'm glad for the opportunity to contribute a little to this discussion. But March the 2nd, 1996, for those who were already in the par party room, I think you need to take into account, as has happened already this morning, the years that we'd been in opposition. Uh, I was 22 months in government. I thought that was pretty good. I quite liked it, actually. But 22 months, and there we were in opposition. And it is different, but there is a great deal that you can do from there uh, if you set your mind to what the main aim of what you're achieving is to be. We need to have a brief look, I think, at the elections that occurred before 1996. We lost in 1983, not disappointing, but not entirely unexpected. I don't think many really expected that we would return to government in 1994, but we had a go. By 1987, there was a fair mood around that we could do it and it should happen derailed, as you might remember, by the Joe for Canberra campaign and a few other things, but that certainly was significant at the time. So 1990 was looking pretty good. Uh, J-curves, um, banana republics, things were beginning to happen that assisted us, but there was still a divisiveness in the party room that made that impossible. And for me, when we changed leader, when we did in 1989, I knew that we would not succeed in 1990, and we didn't. So, 1993, about which we've already heard a great deal this morning, we couldn't lose. We did. So then you've got a party room, I think, that knew that if we didn't behave differently, if we didn't function differently, the party itself was in deep trouble for the future. 1996 had to be focused on quite differently from the indulgences that we had permitted amongst parliamentary party members during the previous years in a sense of not working together as we should have. And we've heard much this morning about the lead to 1996. The significant change being, of course, that by then John Howard was the leader. And as, uh, as we've also heard, Andrew Robb was the campaign director for 1996 and a totally different mood within the parliamentary party as to what our role was during that time and how we should get there. And there are all of the electorates all the Senate campaigns, there are lots of stories that certainly can't be told here today of the campaigns and the way people worked, the sort of people who were the candidates, the, the difference in the electorates in which they are all working. It almost seems a sort of story that hardly rates with the issues that we've been talking about today, and yet it's an important part of the electoral process to look at the electorates, to look at the candidates and see how it is that an overall campaign that is good can then be turned into actually winning seats. We did, and then the results in the House of Representatives were significant, very significant. <coughs> I want to look a little bit at this today, though, through the eyes, through the eyes of Canberra. Not a lot to be said about the campaign in Canberra in leading to 1996. There was an air in parts of this community that Keating had become elitist and they didn't quite like him, but those of the party who were out working, door knocking and at the shopping centres, they would get this message, but we didn't really feel that it was likely to be a vote turning thing. It was pe things people wanted to talk about. Amongst Liberals and those that we relied on in Canberra, there was great excitement and expectation that a change of government was needed for the country, but there was an underlying 
degree of apprehension about what it might actually mean for this community to achieve the things that had to be achieved. And so I think of all the literature that flowed into an electorate officers, and there was quite a bit that year, um, about the national campaign, in a sense we didn't use a lot of that in Canberra. Because frequently it is that the message that's going to sound pretty good in other parts, Townsville, Broome, etc., doesn't work the same in Canberra if you're talking about cutting public service numbers, cutting public expenditure, etc. So I think those of us who worked in the campaign in 1996, we kept a, a sort of a high profile out on the shopping centres and out and about, but we've kept it more to local issues. And I don't recall, I checked this with Andrew Rob, I don't think we had any event in Canberra during the 1996 campaign at which we uh, had, an out, had a federal minister come, or a federal shadow minister come and talk to a sort of group meeting. We kept it a bit to ourselves. The end result was we didn't win any House of Representatives seats, but it would have achieved a 39% vote for the Senate, uh, which is well above a quota. And, uh, um, in, in this electorate, a quite good result, but it certainly doesn't win you any House of Representatives seats. Um, there was, anyway, that we. There's also the story at the same time about going from two to three federal seats, etc. In 1995, holding a liberal seat in Canberra for 12 months after Ros Kelly left and the by-election, but um, that's not quite for this morning's discussion. But it's an interesting part of the story of that era around 1996. A week or so ago, I ran into a fellow who's been around. Canberra for a long time in small business, and I looked at, look, we weren't discussing politics, I just looked at him and said, what did the 1996 election really mean? And he thought, he looked and thought and said, it was pretty tough at the time, but it worked out well. And I, I thought that in a sense summed up, in a sense sums up a number of the things that have been said this morning. But so in 1996, we get to March the 3rd, the beginning of the task ahead and the responsibilities of being in government. And for those who were ministers, they certainly had a busy time. The ACT was hard hit by many of the decisions that you have heard about, referred to today. There is no question about that. Loss of jobs within the public service, uh, about a 25% drop in house prices, and a lot of people's lives were seriously affected. There were times when I felt that the, the language used to explain some of the things that was happening was not, as, not sufficiently sensitive to the people involved. When you're creating jobs, you tend to talk about people. When you're slashing jobs, you just seem to talk about slashing jobs and sometimes it seems to me you forget a little bit about the people who are actually involved in the consequences of those decisions. The other aspect of slashing public service jobs, which I always found intriguing, my view was that if you want to do something in government, you should have the appropriate number of staff to achieve that objective. You might cut functions and cut jobs, but you need to have the appropriate number in the right places to achieve the things that you want to achieve. Um, this, I'm, I'm referring to the concept of across the board cuts, 2% out here or 5% out there. It's never been something that appealed to me, at least in the rhetoric of the way that you are now, if you're putting it to people. But, the consequences of the policies that were, were harsh, the economic policies and the industrial relations and everything else that was going on that we've heard referred to did bring results. The um, huge savings in the interest rates that the government was paying, GDP growth achieved, 
average household incomes did increase. The number of households dependent on pensions reduced. So the results were there, even though in the process there were things happening that perhaps one might have liked to have seen done differently. In Canberra, there was a big change that it's hard to identify in some respects, but there was a big change from the number of people employed in the public service to the number employed in the private sector. And I think that has been beneficial to this community. Many of the new businesses and the new enterprises were still dependent on government income, but being through a pr privately owned firm, it had a different influence on the community, I think, than just public service jobs. So certainly much of the income of the small, some of these new smaller firms came from government, but it did create a difference. Uh, in 1996, I think 60% of the community were employed in the public service. I think now it's down to about 45 or 44 employed in the public service and the rest in the in private, sec private sector. So that's a quite significant change to a community. Now while the economy, the workplace and all of these things were the real focus of government and they had to be and uh, the results were very successful, there was at the same time an issue that was important to John Howard and to his government and it was how Australia saw itself, its self-perception, um, its soul, the federation. And at the same time, right from the time of election, that these other important matters were being dealt with, these other issues were a part of the agenda. And in Canberra, that was perhaps noticed more than in other places. Um, the previous 13 years had been socially divisive in many ways, and certainly in the manifestation of the parliamentary triangle and how it appeared had actually physically been allowed to run down an, in an amazing way. Now, to, on an occasion like this, to start talking about footpaths seems silly, and yet, the structure of the parliamentary triangle, the footpaths had fallen into disrepair. The Western landscaping had been allowed to fall into disrepair to the extent that was scarcely recognisable anymore. But if you are going to have a national capital, like Menzies said, of which the nation could be proud, these things are a part of it and a part of what people see when they come to Canberra, when they come to see the national capital and what it looks like. Right from the beginning, steps were taken to recognise and enhance the way the national capital existed and how it would appear to the rest of the nation. My speech on the development and restructure of the national capital, well, the short version takes 12 minutes, so I shan't embark upon that today, but it has 22 points to it. Um, of things that happened. The National Museum went ahead, wasn't open for some years, wasn't opened in 96, but it started then. John Howard, at the same time as he was doing the things he was doing to bring the budget back into, into where it should be, set up the process of the National Museum. Prior to that, it had been talked about for ages. I can recall three election campaigns where there was a big public announcement. By the third time, I could scarcely believe it. There would be a national museum, and nothing happened. And as I say, there were three previous elections when Labor had, had this big announcement about the museum, as though it was a new event each time. Uh, our commitment was to a new museum, and I hadn't said a lot about it during the campaign because I felt a bit nervous that in the process of bringing the budget back into balance, something might, like the museum 
might sort of slip away to one side and that that would be very embarrassing. And I needn't have worried because the project went ahead or started uh, right from the beginning. The National Archives, which I felt very strongly the parliamentary triangle needed as one of the institutions of the nation that should be recognised within the parliamentary triangle, that was dealt with starting in 1996. I can recall Richard Alston saying to me, don't say a word till I've explained this, but the National Archives is now in the Victoria Building and is a splendid place. There were so many things. Anzac Parade was rebuilt and redeveloped in, in a way that made a real statement about what John Howard thought. In 1996, and I'm sure Jo Gash will mention this later in the day when she speaks, more women were elected to the House of Representatives, a couple more to the Senate, and a splendid photograph of John Howard and all the women on the steps of the House of Reps Rose Garden uh, celebrating that. It did make a difference to the way the party room functioned. There weren't enough new members, but there were a significant increase. Sadly, the numbers have slipped back. That's a discussion for another place and another time, but we need to address that. But at 96, it was quite exciting to have so many new women members. And the Senate. Nothing changed till after the new Senate after the 1st of July, 1996. Uh, the Territory Senators were sworn in on the 30th of April, they being elected every three years, not, not like the other Senators. Michael Behan remained President until the change on the 20th of August, 1996. Uh, the grouping of Labor, Greens and Democrats had 38 votes, uh, 37, the Coalition 38. One more was needed and there was Senator Harradine. A more skillful operator you can't imagine, someone who had the greatest sense of what was best for his constituents and how to get it. The Senate became even more interesting, I think, after 1996, but in August, when the new Senate was formed, the Liberal and National Party supported Senator Colston to become um, Deputy President. It was the case by then that we operated loosely that uh, the deputy president would be from the other party, not in government. And the Labor Party had chosen a candidate, but the Liberal and National Party supported Senator Colston, who withdrew from the Labor Party. He was not popular with his own party for doing this, but it made a difference as we went on to the numbers in the Senate and the way that uh, ministers were able to negotiate to get their legislation through. But you could never forget Senator Harradine and the role that he would play in determining what happened. And others, as we get to the GST in the next retrospective when we speak about it, um, it was a very interesting time. It was an exciting time for those who'd been in the party room to move into government. There were challenges. They had to be faced, but I think as a result, there is no doubt that Australia, as a consequence of 1996, is a much better place now. Um, Kevin, if you'd rejoin us. As you come down, let me ask you, the Liberal Party's managed to produce mavericks over the years, people like Harry Turner, John Jess, Don Chip, what happened to them in 1996, or did you just hide them away? Well, if you look at the whole era, we had some, whether you use the expression mavericks uh, is another question, but we had independence. Uh, there was Bob Catter. Um, old Bob Catter. There was um, um, Paul Filing and Alan Rocha had a falling out in Western Australia. Um, and there was someone else who doesn't come to mind at the moment, but um, so so there's, you know, it, it's. I suppose when you look back 20 years into the past, you forget the tensions and the um, real challenges 
from day to day and week to week and month to month when you're actually there with those matters. But there, there were um, those who, for whatever reason, good or bad, um, had fallen out with the party, or the party had fallen out with them in some instances. Your questions, please. Uh, Brad Rosewell, a, a question for Kevin. Kevin, you, you mentioned a couple of times just in passing, uh, you referred to some uh, notes that you'd taken during the course of party route meetings. Uh, just how detailed are these notes and what do you intend on doing with them? <laughs> um, they, they, are, they are quite detailed. Um, I can go back and tell you for the 10 years that I was the note taker of the party room, what everybody said, in at least in a shortened, paraphrased version of their contributions. It would probably make an interesting book one day, but um, I think it's a little premature at the moment. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Uh, both were interesting presentations. I'm Marion Sims, a, a, an academic currently on secondment at the Australian Research Council. But I just wanted to ask uh, Senator, sorry, I still call you Senator Reid because you were my senator for some years, decades, but just wondering about uh, numbers of women um, and the observation you made. And I wanted to follow up on your very intriguing comment about uh, needs to be addressed or discussed. But I was just wondering if you wouldn't mind responding to one of the kind of, I guess, classic discussions around women in, in politics, which is, is it a supply problem or is it a demand problem? Is it a case that women aren't coming forward um, at this point as they, as they had uh, in the earlier period for the 96 election? Or is it a case that the selection processes are somehow um, you know, whether inadvertently or in other ways, uh, militating against successful pre-selections? A uh, um, bit of both, perhaps, but certainly in 1996, we had to win seats. There were a lot of seats not uh, seen as likely to be won, and men tend not to stand for seats if they don't think they're going to win, about, win them, whereas women will put their hands up. Women will no, I know Gary Nairn, I know, no, no. But, <laughs> but now, I, mean, I think back to 1975, Shirley Walters in Tasmania. They needed, however many number of candidates they needed, and they were a bit short. So Shirley says, "Count me in. I'll be right." You know, I'll put my name on the paper, and she got elected and became. I think the lead senator from Tasmania eventually. Women will put their hands up to do the job that has to be done. I mean, I stood in Benython once because Bob Menzies asked me to, or to no, I think he told me to, <laughs> I, and delivered a lecture about you have to have a, I said, you're not gonna win Benython. He said, you need a candidate in every House of Representatives seat to maximise your Senate vote, so you never leave a set, seat uncontested. So off I went to Benython. That was an experience. <laughs> Women will put their hands up to contest when, when it is needed, and in an occasion like this, 75, 96, when there is a significant swing, you will get a lot of women elected. Now, what that tells me is that there's still something not quite right with the process of selecting candidates and getting the right people in to make sure that we have more women. There aren't sufficient women there at present, and it's something that we really do need to address, because unless you've got a good balance, you haven't got good debate in the party room, and you won't really, in the longer term, have success. So there's work to be done, Marion. Thank you. That's one last question. Well, the question that everyone wants... Oh, no, John Nilekit has a question. <laughs> 
I'm, I'm only asking this question because there was a bit of vacancy. Uh, I just wondered if uh, both of you would give you your reflections on the question of how party leaders uh, are elected. I just raise it. We've had the recent uh, 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 very odd situation in the British uh, Labor <coughs> Party, and then of course there was the change of prime ministership after the uh, Brexit uh, decision. Uh, I just wonder whether you have any thoughts about uh, electing party leaders and. Uh, 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 in light of that, uh, those experiences. Um, I, I support the current system in the Liberal Party, John. Um, ultimately, it's the parliamentary party which is the, the party which is in government or in opposition. A leader has to have the confidence of those men and women that he or she works with on a day-to-day -day basis at the parliamentary level. And um, I think I can see the argument for giving, for example, all members of the political party a say in who the leader is, but I think that becomes a burdensome process. Um, having said that, um, I also am of the view, and I was of the view when Labor was in government, that once a leader is elected, that he or she, well, th that the Australian people have a view, uh, it's not a constitutional view, obviously, or that, that they chose who the Prime Minister is in particular and they want to have the decision whether to get rid of that Prime Minister or not. I think it's different in opposition when you're working through the process of what the party looks like and who the leader is to go into government, but I've always been of the view, and I was even when Kevin Rudd was first Prime Minister, that um, it was wrong to replace him. Not that that mattered to us in the Liberal Party, but that's been my view over time. I agree with that. I think my view is that it's, it's got to be done by somebody. Now, you can change it as much as you like, but I think to, for the parliamentary party to elect the leader is a quite clean and neat way of doing it. Um, to have a plebiscite of the whole party on leadership is quite cumbersome, although I certainly like the concept of plebiscite for choosing candidates. I think there's some, some merit in that, but I see them as quite different things, and I would keep the uh, leadership vote uh, rules as they are at the present time. Thank you. Would you please thank Margaret?